to join me please for a word of prayer our father this is a day that you've given us to live and to be your people help us Lord to know what it truly is to be free not just free in name but free indeed in Jesus name we pray amen you know back many centuries ago, five, six centuries now. When Luther did what he did, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., another great man, but lived uh, in my lifetime, and I'm not that old. But um, go back to Martin Luther, the monk. The reason that he left the church was because there was this idea that, that we could be something before God that we would make of ourselves. You know, you've heard the story that, that if you had sinned, you could go to the, the church at the time, and it happened to be the Catholic church. It was the only church, all right? It's not just the Catholic church. It's the only church. You could go there, and you could pay some money, and they would give you a little piece of paper, a certificate, on which pro- was proclaimed the forgiveness of whatever sin you had chosen to have expunged by your payment. Okay? It was kind of like the same thing as kids. We'd go to the candy store and we'd buy a, a candy bar. Pay a dollar, I'd get a candy bar in return. I could go to the church, pay a dollar, and get a sin removed from my soul. Luther understood differently as he read the New Testament and as he looked at, uh, you know, through the Gospels and he, and he saw Jesus. He saw portrayed there before us the idea of grace. That we can be something before God, not by what we make of ourselves, but by what God has made of us and what God allows us to be. And you can't be a part of this church for very long before you hear that. And you don't last very long in this church if you don't really take that to heart. There are other churches out there that believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that would say to you, you know, you can work out your salvation by doing this or by doing that. You'll be approached from time to time, no doubt, by well-meaning people who want to tell you, you need to do this, 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 and this in order to get to heaven. And some of what they say is very true. I mean, they're proclaiming a relationship with Christ. And man, that is absolutely necessary. But there is nothing that we can do that will get us to heaven. Do you understand that? We're free. This verse in John, you know, that I think it's verse 32, uh, if the Son of Man makes you free, you will be free indeed. That's the last verse, but you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's been quoted out of context a whole lot. But if you take it in context with the verses that are around it, what you understand is that there is one way to know freedom, and that is to know Jesus Christ. One way to be free. One way to be assured of the grace of salvation when we pray and we read in the 14th chapter of John, for instance, that there is a home for us in heaven. You know, we prayed as children, many of us, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Where is he going to take? He's going to take it to be with him in that mansion that we read about in the 14th chapter of John. Where there's one way to be assured of that, and that's to know Christ. We're free. The irony is, Christians, for me, as I watch us, as we, we take our freedom, and then we use that freedom to build a whole other set of walls. You know what that's like? How many, I don't want to see a show of hands, but uh, the, the Lutheran Church has a great Scandinavian heritage, of which I have no part. I am absolutely not. I mean, I'm a little German, but I am absolutely not Norwegian or Danish or Swedish or any of those important flags that are hanging on the wall. I'm from the other part of the world. But I'm Lutheran still. But I grew up in this heritage where, you know, many of our, of our good Lutheran people grew up in homes where Swedish was still spoken and where Norwegian was still spoken and where Danish was spoken and maybe even German was spoken. And if you grew up in a home like that, it was a small leap, wasn't it, to take that uh, uh, tradition of, of keeping that language alive at home to bringing it to church, Right. Don't show your hands because you'll embarrass yourselves or embarrass me. But how many of you grew up in churches where Swedish was still the language of the liturgy? 
And I've been in groups of people having coffee after church where uh, one or two of their members begin to wax eloquent because they've been back to the homeland and they were able to sit through church that was conducted in Norwegian. Schnucker du Norsk. Because you know God speaks Norwegian, right? No. <laughs> If you know nothing else about Jesus, I'm pretty sure that his Scandinavian heritage was absolutely in doubt from the beginning. Jesus had nothing to do with the Swedes or the Norwegians any more than he had to do with the Czechs and the Italians and the Germans from my part of the world. He proclaimed the gospel of freedom. You are free. Because I'm an equal opportunity bully, those of you that grew up Catholic in the 60s, Remember the pre-Vatican days where you would go to church and there was one language of the Mass and it was Latin. I don't know any Latin. The only Latin I know is, is, is always wear underwear. Semper ubi sub ubi. And it's kind of pig Latin at that. But Latin was the language of the Mass. And so, I mean, if you go back in history, yes, indeed, there is a version of the Bible called the Septuagint that is written down in Latin. But it's a later version. It's a very early version of the Bible, but it's later than the originals. Now, Jesus probably understood Latin in the same way that, that uh, a migrant family in this country speaks English. They know enough to get by to order as you're going through the drive-through or to, uh, to uh, ask where the restroom is or to, you know, to get by in business day to day. Jesus probably knew that much Latin because Rome at the time was trying to, in the process of conquering and subduing the known world, bringing them under the order of Roman rule, right? For that matter, Jesus probably also spoke a bit of Greek. Because that was also the language of, of science and, and commerce of the day. But Jesus was a Jew. What do you think he spoke at home? Hebrew. Well, I've never seen a good Swede or a Norwegian line up to hear the liturgy spoken in Hebrew. Probably because we'd have to learn a whole new language. But you see, we take this freedom that we're given to, to hear the, the language in our mother tongue and we take it and we lock it in. Now God all of a sudden has to be Norwegian. There was a church I served. We would sing that, that lovely hymn. You know, uh, um, it was 474 in the old Lutheran book of worship. Children of the Heavenly Father, children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gather, nestling bird or star in heaven, such a refuge there was given. You've heard that song? Okay. I mean, it's one of the old favorites of the church, but it had gone so deep into the, the consciousness of these Scandinavians that we could no longer sing that song in church without also agreeing to sing a verse in Swedish, whether we spoke Swedish or not. That's not freedom. That's slavery. Slavery to something else. We're not worshiping God, we're worshiping Swedish. We're not worshiping God when we go out into our world and we, we, uh, we get our finances in order only so we can actually get more for ourselves. We're being greedy. We're worshiping money. If we want to know freedom, we have to know Jesus. And if we know Jesus and the freedom that he brings all of a sudden you are going to find yourself in a place where all of the props in the world, they fall away. You're going to find yourself in a very strange place because you're going to look around and you're going to realize that nothing looks familiar because all of a sudden everything is possible. You read in the New Testament where Paul says all things are possible. All things are okay. All things now are are, are able for me, are, are, are available to me. What's he talking about? He's talking about this freedom right here. Without Jesus, there is none of that. Further, Jesus is trying to understand how we can take our lives and move God out from the center. He's very much speaking about putting God back in the center of our existence. 
And that as we do that, then the rest of these things fall into line and suddenly we have freedom like we've never known. You know what this is like. I'm sure you are like me and you've gotten up on a Saturday morning and you've got your list before you. The things that you're going to get accomplished that day. I mean, there are a few days in this world that are better than Saturdays, right? Unless it's Mondays, the day I take off. Mondays are great. But Saturday is like that. You get up and the whole world of possibilities is in front of you, right? And then somebody calls. A good friend. Hey, do you got some time today? You're thinking, no. <laughs> but you make time. You choose to make time because that's the kind of person you are. That's the kind of heart that you have. That's the understanding that you have where, where God calls us to, to love one another as He loved us and you realize on some level that this is what is good and right. And so you set your list aside for an hour and you go and you sit with a friend who's sick, who is alone, who needs to, to unload, download some things and, and bounce them off of, of your sane logic. What happens? Lo and behold, in my life, nine times out of ten, I will get to the end of the day and realize with surprise that I got everything on my list done. And I probably had time for more. See what I'm talking about? What that freedom is? We don't even notice it. It comes into our lives and when our heart is right and when we are living in line with God's will, we live in such a way that these things just happen to us and we take them for granted. Don't take that for granted. Because I know you're like me and I know you've lived the other side as well where that friend calls up and says, hey, have you got some time? Well, no, I'm not any time today, but I can talk to you tomorrow. And then you, you go about your day and you, you, you kick it and you kill it and you drag it home and you get everything on your list done and you reach the end of the day and you're exhausted because you've battled the entire day to get it done and you don't even understand why it is that you're so tired because the list wasn't that big this idea of freedom. The idea that we can be free to do all the things that God sets for us to do, to live as God's people freely. If you want to raise your hands when we sing, you're free to do that. If you want to walk around and shake hands while we sing, which, gosh, you did really well this morning. We're free to do that. You realize that? Why are we free? Because of something that we've done to, to push those boundaries back? No, we're free because the Son of God has made us so. And only you can undo that. I've been in congregations where they are trapped. And they feel that they're trapped by things that are beyond their control, by, by finances, by neighborhoods by circumstances that, that, that have caused the congregations, like grace, to become very diffused over the years. And they think to themselves, well, this must be God's plan. No. We've forgotten what it is to be free. Will you remember with me? One simple phrase from the Gospel. That the Son has made us free. We are free indeed. Not by anything that we've done, not by any law, not by any, any works of ours, but we are free by grace as a gift. Now if you hear what I'm saying and you really read this Gospel, you're going to go home today and things are going to look a little different. Not exactly the same as they were because we're not bound anymore by the, the silly little laws that we put in place. My father had some of those silly little laws. I grew up thinking that if I used the car and I didn't return it clean and, and full of gas like I found it, 
that the world was going to end. No. He wasn't very happy, but the world didn't end. How many rules, how many silly little laws have we got in place? That's not freedom. But remember with me, the Son has made us free, and we are free indeed. That was the genius of the Reformation. And you know, the Catholic Church isn't that evil entity. They are the mothership. I believe firmly in my heart of hearts, and we can talk about this offline, that God is working to draw all of these organizations back into one. Not that we have to be one big church again. But it didn't take the leaders of the church long to see the logic and the wisdom and the grace of what Martin Luther, the monk, was trying to say hundreds of years ago. All that's left for us today is to live it out. The Son has made us free. How will that change your life this week? Amen.